George Sigler was an officer and pilot in the U.S. Navy. He served in Vietnam, flying A-3 carrier-based jets. He became interested in ocean survival while in the Navy, and because of his concern for the number of persons who died at sea, he developed a survival kit. He enlisted the Navy's help in doing medical research and decided to test the survival skill by sailing across the ocean. He and his sailing partner, Charlie Gore, sailed in an inflatable rubber boat from San Francisco to Hawaii, testing survival equipment, techniques, and human endurance. Today, Mr. Sigler owns a small air carrier which is involved in firefighting and animal research with the Department of Interior. So ladies and gentlemen, I give you George Sigler. Thank you so much. Uh, well, I'd, I'll say good morning again. I, uh, uh, I am George Sigler, and I was born and raised in uh, Abilene, Texas, about as far from the ocean as you might want to get, but I was always thrilled about uh, boats and sailing. Um, I uh, graduated from college in a small uh, community college or uh, uh, church college uh, called McMurray University in Abilene, Texas in 1968, and then I joined the U.S. Navy. I reported here uh, to Pensacola in 1968 uh, to the Officers Candidate School, and then began my Navy career right here in Pensacola. Uh, in the uh, finest tradition uh, of the U.S. Navy, and I don't mean to offend anybody, but I'm gonna tell you a, a pretty outlandish story. Uh, and when I reported to naval aviation, any time a naval pilot starts a story, they already start it with, hey, guys, this is no shit. So that's how a Navy story always starts. And you don't know whether to totally believe it or not. And there's some fantastic stories that uh, naval aviators have about carrier operations and uh, battleship operations and whatnot. But uh, anyway, I my intent, uh, after the, my naval career was to be an airline pilot, but after uh, a few thousand hours flying jet aircraft at 30 or 40,000 feet, uh, and I did fly the A3 Sky Warrior. It, the Sky Warrior is not in the museum, it's out on the flight line. It's the largest uh, uh, naval jet that we routinely operated on a carrier. So uh, I decided after Vietnam, I served a tour on the USS Hancock in Vietnam, that uh, I'd like to get a, a job. I was out uh, in the marine industry, get a job in the marine industry. I was out in uh, Alameda, California, and uh, I had a tough time trying to find a job because I really didn't know anything about boats. I was a naval aviator, and uh, my limited knowledge about boats was an aircraft carrier. So uh, because I couldn't get a job, I uh, d had to decide what I was going to do now. I began to read a lot of books. One of the books I read was uh, Survive the Savage Sea, by, written by Dougal Robinson. Now, Dougal Robinson was a British master mariner, and he was sailing around the world with his family in, in a large a sailboat, and uh, he was sunk by whales down near the Galapagos Island. After reading his book, it became evident that he, even though he was a British master mariner, he was very ill-prepared for ocean survival. So I read that book, I read a few more books, and I decided, because I went through my survival training right here in Pensacola, uh, that I could produce a better survival kit. So I began to research you know, what it would take uh, to maintain life uh, in, in the open ocean in a life raft. Now my philosophy of survival, and this was before we had these emergency locator beacons that can actually pinpoint your geographic location pretty much anywhere in the world. This is before that time. So my philosophy of survival became save yourself. You know, have enough equipment and enough knowledge that you could either sell your dinghy or life raft either to a shipping lane or to landfall. So because I was in California uh, out there, I looked out, where would I test a, a life raft? Well, the Hawaii Islands, uh, the Juan Islands were the closest group of islands uh, out there that I could sell to. but. Before I did any of that, I had to research how to keep body and soul alive for a what period of time. Now, what I did is I plotted on all the world's map 
how long it would take a person to either sail into a shipping lane or sail to landfall from any ocean in the world. And I came up with a number of about 60 days. In 60 days, no matter where you may have found yourself in any ocean, you could sail into a shipping lane or to landfall. So my goal of keeping body and soul together became 60 days. So I, I, uh, I was very fortunate. I, the Oakland, in Oakland, California, there was a great library and a lot of research material there. And I was also, also lucky that the Navy had a clinical investigation unit at the Oakland Naval Hospital. So I spent about nine months reading books on survival. I read everything from Captain Bly when he's put off the, the bounty. In fact, is uh, some of the things in the, that ended up in the survival kit, some of the ideas came from Captain Bly. He was an amazing seaman. Uh, but I read Thor Heyerdahl's Kentucky, and I borrowed some, th some things from Heyerdahl. But I read over 3,000 accounts of castaways, and I kept little five by eight cards. And I'd make a note any time a castaway said there was something in the survival kit that didn't work, I made a note of that. Or if they said there was something that they needed that wasn't in the survival kit, I made a note of that. And of course, I'd gone through the Naval Survival School and I realized just little things can make a difference of living and dying. And uh, the Navy, and, and they may still, I haven't looked at a Navy survival kit in recent history, but when I went through the training, we had a survival knife. Unfortunately, it was made of metal, and if it was in the ocean more than a couple of days, it just turned to rust. And when you opened a, a most survival kits at that period of time had fishing kits in them, but the fishing kits, the, the hooks were made of uh, just steel. And when you opened them up, if they'd been exposed to seawater for any point of time, they were useless. They just broke apart. They were just like a mass of rust. So there was a lot of things I learned about ocean survival from reading the books. But my intent in reading all the books uh, was to find out mainly how to keep my body alive for 60 days. Now, the, I like to eat a lot. Now, some of these pictures, I was pretty skinny. <laughs> but... Uh, the first thing I tackled, I knew water, the lack of water was going to be my major problem in crossing an ocean and a life raft, and, and it's a major problem in most castaways. Uh, so I got into the food uh, e evolution first, and I determined that uh, I, I thought after reading all the experimentation, especially the experiments that were done on human beings in World War II, pretty hard experiments, but I determined that I could probably live 60 days in a life raft with no food at all. Because in a life raft, I intended to be in a basal condition or a resting condition. I wasn't going to row this rubber boat anywhere. I was going to put a small little cell up and sail to safety. And the Navy uh, had life rafts at that time that you could rig a cell on and sail to safety. So I... Uh, I thought, well, 60 days uh, with no food, that seemed like a long time. So I went to the Naval Hospital, uh, and uh, I had three doctors out there, younger guys, who were really interested in this experiment. They said, George, if you're crazy enough to want to float a life raft across the ocean with no food, you know, we'll, we'll do the medical uh, base rate studies, and if the Navy will agree, if you make it to Hawaii, uh, that we'll send, we'll come over there and do the final studies. And the reason the Navy was interested in it is because we picked a lot of castaways up from World War II and Vietnam and other uh, conflicts, and we knew what condition they were when we picked them up, but we didn't know what condition they were when they started their survival trek. So they thought we could get a good baseline on you before you leave and then come to Hawaii and do another another uh, physiological study on you. So they, the Navy doctors were all in favor of this. Now, I showed them my research material and, and said, you know, I think I could live 60 days with no food. And they were a little apprehensive about that. But once they looked at my research material that I'd gathered, and, and like I say, I was going to stay in a resting condition the whole time. I was going to do no physical activity other than what was required to stay alive. So they agreed, but they said, George, one of the doctors was a psychologist and he said, the problem I see is if a castaway opens the survival kit, the first thing they're gonna look for is the food. You know, we, that's just, we're accustomed to that. And they say, psychologically, that would be a very bad thing. Now, I'd read a lot of accounts of rescuing airmen and seamen in World War II in the North Atlantic. And they found a lot of the men in those life rafts 
had died, not because of any psych uh, physiological reason, they just died because they gave up the will to live. There was no apparent reason for them to have died in the life raft. So the doctor, I thought, well, you know, he may be right. People might get very discouraged if they hadn't heard a speech like this, they'd done a lot of research, if they opened a survival kit and there was no food in it. So now I had, if, if I was gonna put food in the survival kit, I had to elect what kind of food. Now there's only three groups. There's carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. So I immediately uh, learned that I couldn't put protein type food in a life raft uh, for ocean use because protein type food takes more water for digestion and elimination than any other type food product. So lack of water was gonna be a problem anyway. So the last thing I wanted to do was put any protein in a survival kit. Now, if I were going hiking through the mountains or in, in a, a remote region, I might put some protein in a survival kit because you may need it if you're gonna be doing a lot of physical activity, but I was not going to do any physical activity. So I could not put protein in the survival kit. Now, I like the fats and oils. And, but the problem with the fats and oils, they go rancid. Now, if I were going across the ocean in the next couple of weeks, I'd probably go to the health food store and buy, buy some vitamin E ta or uh, wheat germ uh, tablets because wheat germ is high in vitamin E and vitamin E retards the process of the oil going rancid. So it'd be a pretty good survival ration and mountaineers have used wheat germ for years. So uh, it wasn't anything new. But still, I didn't know how long the survival kit might be aboard a boat or an airplane before it was ever used. So I, I just couldn't take the chance on the fats and oils. Now, the one reason I liked the fats and oils, because they had about four times the calories as the carbohydrate products that I could put in a survival kit. So they would be a great survival ration, but I just couldn't pack them in a survival kit. So the next thing I looked at was the uh, uh, carbohydrates. And the Navy for years had packed Charms candy in their survival kits. And the nice thing about the Charms candy, you had a whole bunch of different flavors. You had grapefruit and cherry and grape. And, and so, but the, uh, that's a sucrose sugar, a very simple sugar. Now I could have looked at glucose. Glucose can be used directly by the cells, but it was hard to pack and it was more complex and more expensive. So I finally decided to put three pounds of sucrose sugar for every person that the survival kit was designed to uh, sustain life. And so that's what I ended up finally putting in the survival kit was sucrose sugar. So I, had, I thought I had the food problem solved. And again, it was more for psychological reasons than physiological reasons. So I went past the food problem. Now the next problem, which was a real problem, uh, was how, how was I gonna produce water in a uh, life raft? And how was I gonna put water in a life raft? Well, the Navy at that time had used canned water, and that's a chemical process to precipitate salt out of uh, seawater. But the trouble with the desalting kits is they take a lot of space, they were very heavy, and to put desalting kits in a survival kit to sustain life for 60 days, the survival kit itself would weigh more than the life raft. So I couldn't use the desalting kits. Uh, I looked at canned water, but canned water had the same drawbacks as the desalting kits. I couldn't put enough water in the survival kit to sustain life for 60 days. Um, and the amount of water that I was looking at was really relatively small. I determined, again, through a lot of research, that if I stayed out of the sun, I could sustain life for 60 days drinking eight ounces of water a day. Now that's, that's a, like a coffee cup full of water a day. Now I learned one of the things from Captain uh, Bly was I could wear long sleeve uh, wool clothing, long sleeve uh, pants. Now that sounds like a terrible thing to be wearing, especially in the tropics, but the Navy used wool clothing uh, for a good reason for years because wool retains about 70% of its insulation value even when it's wet. So you can get wool soaking wet and you can still stay relatively warm. So I got some wool clothing for that reason, long sleeve wool shirts from the Navy. And during the life raft trip, it, I found that it was as important to conserve water as it was to make water. Now the way I finally decided to make water, and you can see it in some of these pictures, is a big round ball in the background. That's a solar distillation kit. And we use those in the military for years. With the solar steel, 
I could actually convert seawater to fresh water. And so that's what I ultimately packed. I can make about a quarter water a day with one solar steel. So we packed solar steels in the survival kit. Now, they do have a significant drawback. If you get a lot of cloudy weather, they don't make a lot of water. And I'd never uh, spent much time between San Francisco and Hawaii, and I didn't realize how many cloudy days I was going to encounter, and we encountered a lot. But uh, anyway, that's why we packed in this survival kit. We intended to drink about eight ounces of water a day. Now, with the wool clothing, we, in order to keep our bodies cool without perspiration, which uses a lot of body water, we just simply had little uh, cups that we dipped in the ocean and out off of the coast of California, the ocean water is about 58, 59 degrees, so it's very cold. Near Hawaii, it gets up to about 72, 74 degrees. But we just poured water over us all day long to keep our bodies cool without using perspiration to keep the body cool. So uh, I will tell you that starving to death, I, I, when I left on the trip, I weighed 184 pounds. When I got to Hawaii, I weighed 128. And I knew I was going to lose a lot of weight. Obviously, if you're, you're not eating a lot of food, uh, you're going to lose weight. Now, I did think uh, I would catch fish on the way. I mean, and I thought I would get rain uh, sometime during the trip because I knew the trip was going to take about 60 days. And um, so anyway, I, uh, I thought I'd had the water problem solved. I've, I solved the problem about what to eat. And then the next problem I was is how I was going to navigate a life raft. What could a castaway expect to do for navigation? And the one problem I saw immediately is whoever was the navigator of the aircraft or the yacht that may have sunk may not have survived the incident that caused it to sink. So I had to find a navigation system that was very, very simple. So once again, back to the Oakland Library, and I read hundreds of books on navigation. I even went to the carrier Enterprise in Hancock, which are home base there in Alameda at the time, and I asked the ship's navigators, because uh, all my navigation experience as a pilot was electronic stuff. And uh, so they suggested that what, maybe I could put a miniature compass in the survival kit. But the trouble with the miniature comp or the sextant is that uh, you have to have some knowledge on how to use the sextant, you have to have some knowledge on the stars and how to shoot a shot, and then you have to have reduction tables in order to determine uh, what you're actually looking at. And so I decided, no, I couldn't put a sextant in the survival kit. So I developed through a lot of research, I used a lot of information from the Air Force, and I developed a little card that's no bigger than this that I could navigate anywhere in the world with a wristwatch, and, a, and the accuracy was about 30 nautical miles. Now, 30 nautical miles is not real accurate as far as aviation goes, but as far as a life raft, it wasn't too bad. So, I, and if I had an accurate watch, and I did, I had a little uh, Casio watch, uh, I could actually determine latitude and longitude, but I didn't need um, a watch uh, or an, a super accurate watch to determine my latitude. Now, latitude was important because most bodies of land are oriented north and south. So I wanted to stay on a parallel of latitude. Uh, it was about 22 degrees north is what I wanted to end up uh, in a Y at because that was about the mid chain of the Y and chain and I figured I'll shoot for the middle of the islands and then if I miss north or south I'll, I'll hit either Oahu or Kauai or the big island of Hawaii. So, um, so I figured out the navigation system. Now I used to teach this at the University of California. I used to teach a survival course there and I'd just start the class because a lot of the folks out there in the class were real leery about how to navigate. And I'd, I'd say, look, with this little plate and a wristwatch, I'll guarantee you I'll teach everybody in this class how to navigate within 30 nautical miles from any ocean in the world, and it'll take me about an hour to do that. And I did it every time. It was very simple, and the directions were all on it. So you, you really, if you had a wristwatch, uh, you, you just couldn't miss. And if you had an accurate wristwatch, you could actually determine uh, your longitude, how far east or west you may be progressing. So I solved the navigation system, and I'd solved the food problem, solved the water problem, and the Navy was cooperating, and we were, we were ready to shove off. Now, I was going to do this as a solo venture because I didn't have many friends that I thought I could ask that wanted to go across the ocean in a rubber boat with no food and, and no water, to start out with no water. 
but I had flown in Vietnam with a very headstrong guy named Charlie Gore. And uh, I did ask uh, my wife, I'd just been married uh, a little less than a year when I decided to do this. Uh, she said, why don't you find somebody to go with you? And finally, I called Charlie and Charlie said, well, I've got a, a slot with American Airlines, but it's not until, you know, nine months from now. So yeah, I'll go with you. So anyway, and I, the nice thing about Charlie is he was a very religious guy and I knew Charlie would not quit no matter how hard things got. And I knew things were probably going to get pretty hard. Uh, so uh, anyway, Charlie decided to go along with me on, on the venture and, and I was glad to have his company. So we took off. Uh, it was uh, July uh, 5th or July 4th, 1974. Uh, we had a big yacht take, take us out to the Farallon Islands. The Farallon Islands are about 30 miles off the coast of the, uh, San Francisco outside the Golden Gate. And that's where we launched the uh, rubber boat, which we call Courageous. Charlie named the boat from the movie Captain's Courageous. He loved that movie, so that's how the name became Courageous. But uh, anyway, we, we started out. Now, uh, it was important to stay on a parallel of attitude, and that's what sailors had to do before the chronometer was invented. You know, if you were coming from England and going to go to South America or the America, you had to look at the North Star, and you had to keep the North Star in a certain position, and they had calibration tools to do that even back then, but they didn't have chronometers. So they had to sail down to a parallel latitude and then uh, go west or east till they hit the body of land that they were aiming for. And that's what Charlie and I had to do. Now, we, we started off from California, and we had the Japanese current uh, on the uh, west coast. The Japanese current will take you south, and then it'll take you west as the trade winds. Uh, on the east coast, it's the exact opposite. If you go out 30 nautical miles on the east coast, you're going to get in, uh, you're going to go north, and then you're going to go east. Uh, so uh, I tell people, they say, well, George, we don't need a survival kit because we only sail about 20, 30 miles offshore. Now, this was in California. And I said, look, if you sink out there and get in a rubber boat, guess where you're going to end up? You're going to go south down towards Mexico, and then you're going to get in a trade wind, and you're going to go out in the middle of the ocean and go towards Hawaii. And I cannot tell you how many people that I read about and saw, and some that came to my uh, store wanting information about ocean survival, but wouldn't take a dinghy that they could maneuver or take some proper survival equipment and a lot of them wrote books about their adventure, but what happened, the one I remember most was a trimaran coming down from Oregon, down the California coast, coming to San Francisco, and he sunk out there, he overturned, and there were four or five of them aboard. About 40 days later, they picked up one survivor, and they were almost halfway, the boat had almost floated halfway to Hawaii. So anyway, Charlie and I left, we got into that uh, Japanese current, we started going south. Now the most interesting part of the trip and the scariest part happened the second day out. We were about 80 miles off the coast of Monterey and we gotten on the, on the backside of a pretty bad storm and the wave conditions uh, had built up to about 20 foot but occasionally Charlie and I'd look out and we'd see a wave that was much larger than 20 foot, probably 40 foot. Now, if you've ever seen the promo to the book, The Perfect Storm, where the boat's going up, the, looks like it's going up the wave vertically, we saw waves that were a vertical wall of water, just like that wall, 40 foot tall. And, but it, we could see them off to the left, off to the right. And these were called the rogue waves. And about 10 o'clock in the morning on the second day out, I was sleeping in the bottom of the boat trying to stay out of the wind because we were soaking wet the whole time. And, uh, and with 59 degree water and, and a lot of wind blowing, you get a lot of wind chill. So I was in the bottom of the uh, Courageous uh, trying to rest. Charlie was at the helm and he yelled at me. He said, George, we're gonna take white water aboard, which simply meant, because we'd been taking white water all night, that a wave was gonna crash into the rubber boat. And then we just had it as like a big bathtub and it was 59 degree water and very cold. So I kind of braced myself for a cold shower and all of a sudden I felt a G-force and it felt like to me, like, the, like I was pulling into a loop in an airplane. I, I said, dude, this is not good. <laughs> the G-force was not good. Well, what had happened, we had a rogue wave come up behind us. And there was no, we couldn't get out of the way. We had a little square sail. You can see in the picture there, seven foot by five foot square sail. 
and there was nothing we could do. And so uh, I just kind of hang, grabbed onto anything I could because I knew this was going to be bad. And we just went up the side of this wave and we literally fell off the front side of it, but we fell upside down. And when I finally got my wits about me, I, I was getting out from this sleeping bag that clung to me like a wet t-shirt and I thought I was going to drown trying to get out of the sleeping bag. And then once I got out and I looked, I was looking down <laughs> into the water and, it, and I always remember it was just crystal clear blue. It was so beautiful and I could see a lot of our equipment floating away. <laughs> it was very discouraging. So I dove under the raft, I got up on the other side and the wind was blowing 35, 40 knots. And anytime the wind got about 35 or 40 knots, even if it was a perfectly clear day, we call that a storm because we knew the wave conditions were gonna be dangerous. So anyway, I came up on one side of the rubber boat and I couldn't see Charlie. And I started yelling and it was hard to project your voice in 35, 40 knots of wind. And finally I saw him swim around on the other side and we both crawled up on the bottom of the overturned uh, rubber boat. Now that rubber boat had been in San Francisco Bay sitting in the water for about three or four weeks and it had small little barnacles on the bottom. And so we, we scraped our arms and legs uh, and you know we were ble bleeding uh, pretty profusely. And of course I thought about sharks, oh God, are we gonna, you know, we're having a bad enough day now, uh, are, are we gonna have a shark problem? Uh, but, and, and as the funny thing about it, we saw some fins going through the water those fins were from sunfish. These sunfish are like that wide and they lay on the water sideways and their fins stick up and they, you know, first we thought they were sharks, but just huge sunfish. But uh, anyway, Charlie and I had these little one person life rafts that the Navy used. And we thought if we did turn over, we'd just inflate those and then get on one side of the courageous and lift one side up and just flip it back over. Well, we, we put them in the water, we did that, but one thing we didn't think about, because we never practiced this, is the suction on the water. We couldn't break the suction, so when we tried to lift the Zodiac up, all it did was drive the two little one-person rafts down into the water. So we tried that for about three hours, and I looked over at Charlie. I couldn't even feel my fingers anymore, and my hands were useless, and his lips were turning purple, and I said, Charlie, we're getting hypothermia. I said, you know, we're gonna have a real serious problem if we don't think of something. So we got back up on top of the overturned raft and I said, look, Charlie, I'm gonna go down and see if I can find a foot pump. I'm gonna dive under the boat. If I can find the foot pump, I'm gonna deflate the boat. <laughs> Charlie, Charlie kind of looked at me strange. He said, George, we can't take the air out of the boat. What if it sinks? You know, then we're really in trouble. And I said, well, I, I don't think I can take that much air out that it actually sink. So anyway, I dove under the boat, and I found a foot pump, I handed it up to Charlie, and mind you, all this time, the wave and wind were just beating us to death. And uh, once I had the foot pump, I deflated the life raft. And I can't, it was pretty discouraging because I was under it and uh, listened to all the air come out of it. And then once it got floppy on top of the water, then Charlie and I got on top of it and we pulled it over itself uninflated. Once we got it upright, and then we got the foot pump, we reinflated it, and we evaluated what equipment we have. Now, we were in deep hypothermia, and we lost one of the sleeping bags. We had two, and uh, Charlie and I lost all modesty, believe me. We got in the same sleeping bag, and we stayed huddled next to each other for the next two days because we, we had uncontrollable shivers, and we, we were in deep trouble uh, with hypothermia. So, but we evaluated, you know, what we still had in the life raft. We still had the survival kit. Yeah, we, we lost one of the solar stills, which would limit our production of water, but we really still had everything in the life raft that we were out there to test anyway. And I just told Charlie, I tried to put the best spin on this I could. I said, Charlie, you know, this is really more realistic than ever now. <laughs> so, Cause now we got the trauma going on. So anyway, we decided to continue on. But I will tell you that any time the wind got above 35, 40 knots after that, we took the sail down and, and we anchored that life raft with sea anchors to the surface of the ocean. And, and now we went through about three other major storms and it seemed like every storm started kicking up about 10 o'clock at night. And by about three o'clock in the morning, we had these horrendous waves and at night, 
unless it's a moonlit night, but a dark night, you can't see the waves, but you can hear them. I, it sounded like you're sitting on a railroad track and a train's coming at you. You can hear these massive waves coming and you can't see them. And that was this, probably one of the scariest things to me on the, uh, on the trip is those waves coming at you at night and not being able to see what was coming. And, and of course, we always had that fear about um, turning over again. Now, I will tell you, I tell people, I said, you know, when something bad happens in your life, and I'm 71 years old now, it might be the best thing that ever happened in your life. The best thing that ever happened to Charlie and I is we turned over that second day because we had enough physical energy and power and stamina to make all the mistakes we made and finally get the life raft. If that had to happen 35 or 40 days later, I don't think we'd have survived that because we just didn't have the energy. Now, I will tell you, starving to death, after about the first five days with no food, uh, you lose all that physical uh, pain of being hungry, but you cannot stop thinking about food. I tell you, I read, I, I've given this speech to a lot of people, and uh, one time I was giving it and a guy came up and he said, George, I was a prisoner of war in Germany in World War II. And we did the same thing. We couldn't stop thinking about food. And Charlie and I wrote recipes down. We'd get the darndest recipes in our head and we'd write these down in a little book, a log we had. But you cannot stop thinking about food once you're starving to death. About 10 or 15 days without food, you even dream about food. I mean, it was unbelievable. I mean, we, we just could not stop thinking about food. Now, um, one of the more interesting times on the trip is we were about 300 miles off the coast of Los Angeles. It's about two o'clock in the morning and I was back at the helm just kind of relaxing. We didn't do any work that we didn't have to do. And all of a sudden something huge began to surface next to the uh, life raft. And I looked over and I thought, boy, the U.S. Navy is coming through. They're probably got a submarine out here. They probably saw us turn over. <laughs> but I looked over there and it was a huge right whale. And it, if you ever saw the book uh, Cast Away with Tom Hanks where he's on the life raft and he's looking at the whale. Well, when I lived in San Francisco, I lived at a marina called Barn Hills Marina. And believe it or not, Tom Hanks' dad lived in the next floating home. And I met Tom Hanks when he was just a kid. And I swear to God, I think Tom Hanks put that in that movie because he heard this story. But Anyway, this right well came up right next to the uh, Courageous, and I was looking at it, and its eye was about that big, and that right well was looking at me, and we were just kind of evaluating each other, and it just stood there. Now, we determined that we were in a pod of whales. There were about five whales, and they were going south. And, uh, but anyway, this, when I was looking at the whale, I could, could, I, I could almost reach out and touch it, but it was covered in barnacles. And I told Charlie, of course, I got Charlie up. He was resting. I said, Charlie, I'm not worried about the whale coming up under us. You know, if he turns us over, we already been through that drill. We know how to get the raft back up. But I said, look at those barnacles. He'll scrape the bottom out of the life raft and there would be no way to repair that damage. So even though it was fascinating, it was very scary to be in a pod of whales swimming by the, and it was dark, so we couldn't, see under the boat to see if one of them was under the boat. But one of them did get right out in front of the boat and he dove and that uh, uh, fin was so large and it slapped the water. If it had slapped our rubber boat, it would have destroyed it. But anyway, the, the, the whale went on south and we continued on our way. Now, Charlie and I did, uh, when we left California, the young doctors at the clinical investigation unit with the Navy were all in favor of this experiment, you know. And so they had to meet with an admiral that was in charge over in the West Coast there. And they, they, they briefed the admiral on what we were doing and how we'd planned it. And, and then the admiral asked the deadly question. He said, do you think these guys are going to make it? And the doctor said, no. <laughs> and it was mainly because of lack of water they, they feared for us. And oh, the admiral said, well, we can't, the Navy can't officially endorse them. He said, I, he said look, I'll let you do the experimentation, and if they make it, you know, we'll send you to Hawaii and, and do the uh, studies. But he said, we're not going to publicize it at all that these are two Navy pilots out there uh, in, in the ocean trying to cross it with no food and very little water. So we were not an official Navy project by any means. Uh, anyway, we, uh, we were floating along there uh, one day, or actually it was night. Uh, one of the 
interesting things that uh, again happened. Uh, we were very hungry. We ate one of these little charms tab tablets uh, three times a day, one for breakfast, one for lunch, and one for supper. And, and the breakfast one we ate at six o'clock in the morning at noon uh, for the noon meal and six in the afternoon for the afternoon meal. And after about 30 days, I was sucking on one of these charms tablets and I realized that I couldn't tell what flavor it was. And I sucked on it, sucked on it. And then when I pulled it out of my mouth, it was red and I knew immediately it was cherry and I could taste it then. When I saw it, I could taste it. So I told Charlie, I said, Charlie, I said, I bet if I give you one of these charms tablets and you don't see it, I bet you can't tell me what flavor it is. And he said, no way. And I said, all right. So he closed his eyes. I got one of these charms tablet, tablets. Now, neither one of us liked grapefruit. So of course I picked a grapefruit one and I popped it in Charlie's mouth and he sucked on it, sucked on it. And he said, George, I don't know. And so when he pulled it out, he saw it was grapefruit and he said, oh God, I hate grapefruit. <laughs> but he could taste it. So I tell the story because, you know, food preparation, what it looks like is pretty important. I never realized it, but uh, we could not, we just lost our sense of taste. Now we could taste salt. Now I will tell you, contrary to what we did learn in the Navy, we did drink salt water on the trip, but I'd read a book called From Fish to Philosopher by Homer Smith. And if anybody in the audience is a uh, kidney specialist, you probably have read that book. And, um, but I knew uh, from that book that I could mix uh, about uh, one-tenth of salt water with the fresh water. Now, the salt water has a major problem, uh, other than the fact it's salty, is that it has a chemical property very similar to Epsom salts, which is used as a laxative. And what normally happens with a castaway that they start drinking salt water, they first probably get diarrhea before they get the electro electrolyte balance in the brain uh, confused. Uh, and once you get diarrhea out there, you're gonna lose so much body water, now you've aggravated everything and your chances of survival are very, very slim. So even though Charlie and I, and I got this from Thor Heyerdahl, by the way, Thor Heyerdahl had a bunch of fresh water on, on Contiki. But he said you could drink, drink a gallon of it and not feel like you got a drink. But if you mixed a little salt water with it, with the minerals and all, he said it actually quenched your thirst. And we found the same thing. You know, uh, the distilled water really had no flavor. And so we mixed a little salt water with it. But we had to be real careful that we were not going to get diarrhea out there in that life raft. So, uh, but we did drink a certain amount of salt water with our fresh water. And it did increase our water supply. Now, we measured the, we usually had our drink in the evening after the sun had made some water during the day. And we drank it and we tried to measure it out as precisely as we could. And if you ever wondered why uh, cups in a survival raft are incremented in ounces, it's because you want to make sure you got the same amount of water as anybody else in that life raft. So we measured it exactly. And the guy that measured the water out, he gave the two bottles to the, the other guy, to me, let's say. And I looked at him and said, yeah, they look pretty even. And that's, well, one morning, uh, well, one afternoon, Charlie gave me my bottle. It was late in the afternoon. It was getting a little dark. And uh, he handed me my water bottle. I kind of looked. Yeah, they looked even. And, but what I didn't notice, the color was not the same. And what Charlie had done, we finally uh, realized during the raft trip, it took too much energy to try to urinate going over the side of the, the life raft. And by the way, we never had a bowel movement on the whole trip, ever. <laughs> because we weren't eating anything, so we never had a bowel movement. So we never had to worry about falling off the boat trying to take a, have a bowel movement. But we did urinate in these bottles. And, uh, they, and unfortunately, I learned that the water bottles looked exactly like the bottle we urinated in. So Charlie handed me my bottle. I drank it down and I said, wow, Charlie, that, how much salt water did you put in that? And he said, I didn't put any salt water in it. He said, oh, George. He said, I am sorry, I drank the urine. Uh, by the way, you don't gain anything by drinking your own urine. The kidneys are so efficient. But uh, anyway, I, I wasn't mad about it. He was, he was hurt more than I was about the evolution. But uh, anyway, uh, I did drink the urine bottle that night. And so after that, we marked the urine bottle. We scrapped, uh, made scratches in the plastic so we knew even at night we could feel the, uh, the grooves in it that that was the urine bottle, not the water bottle. Uh, our navigation uh, was fairly accurate. Uh, we, uh, 
we stayed on the parallel of latitude pretty accurately during the trip. And, uh, and also because I had an accurate watch, I knew how much we were progressing. One day, Charlie and I were sitting in the life raft. We had a radio that we could broadcast line of sight. It was the VHF radio. One day I was sitting in the life raft and I saw a great big orange ball in the sky and it wasn't a sun. It was a Braniff Airline. Braniff Airline at that point of time had a flight out of Dallas, Texas, direct to uh, Honolulu. And I looked up and I saw that big orange airplane. And so I fumbled around and by the time I got the VHF radio out, and of course line of sight, uh, I couldn't see the aircraft any longer, but I called him and I said, you know, Braniff uh, over the Pacific, Braniff over the Pacific, this is Life Raft Courageous. And, and the pilot answered and uh, his name was Snodgrass. And uh, he, uh, I said, well, look, uh, you know, we're courageous. And he said, yeah, we've read about you. We've been expecting the call that you might contact us. And so he gave us all the news. He told us Nixon resigned and, and uh, Gerald Ford was now president and Charlie and I looked at each other and said, who's Gerald Ford? <laughs> so, but he gave us the results of the Wimbledon tennis tournament and whatnot. And he gave us an accurate time hack so I could check to see if my watch was still accurate. So uh, we got very near Hawaii uh, and we hadn't eaten. We ran out of all of the sugar after 40 days. So from the 40th day till the 54th day, we just didn't have anything to eat. And, and I had a very well planned out fishing kit, but I could not catch a fish. The only fish I ever caught was a, a great white shark, which is about 18 foot long. It was longer than the boat. And, uh, and I caught him on a tennis shoe. I was sitting in the raft one day. We had these great big hooks so we could catch a shark. And, uh, and we did catch one. We got this great white shark and we had this steel leader line, 115 pound test steel leader line tied to this rubber boat. And I told Charlie, that shark will tear this boat apart. And he starts thrashing around. So the shark came up, he ate the tennis shoe. I unwound the steel line and we had two of them out. I cut that tennis shoe in half and then the shark went around. He was on the surface. You can see his dorsal fin. I think there's a picture of it in the book. But uh, he took the other tennis shoe and just as he was pulling that tennis shoe away, that steel leader line started wrapping around my arm and I told Charlie I said I'd rather him pull my arm off than go in the water I could not defend myself against that great white being in the water and luckily for me the line did come off my arm because I was thought he was going to pull my wrist off if nothing else but anyway that shark went about 50 foot on the port side of the raft he was on the surface he kicked up his tail fin they get all the motivation from that tail fin and he came right towards Courageous. And he looked like he was gonna ram us. I mean, white water was coming off, it looked like a torpedo. And I told Charlie, I said, he's gonna ram us. And we grabbed hold of the raft. There wasn't anything we could do to, to defend ourselves against the shark. And the shark dove, sounded just before he got to the raft. We, we could literally feel the compression of him going under. He didn't hit the raft. And then we jumped to the other side and all we saw was this big dark object going deep. And we never saw the shark again, but he still had this two uh, fishing lines coming out of his mouth. So, well, we got near Hawaii and our agreement with the U.S. Coast Guard, because they were involved with this, that if they didn't hear from us in 60 days, they might look for us somewhere around the Hawaiian Islands. Now, that was pretty nebulous because we could have sunk anywhere. We could have sunk 80 miles off the coast of Monterey. But I, uh, I got the radio out because we were about 120 miles from Honolulu. And uh, I thought, well, there's airplanes making descents into Honolulu and I'll call and see if I can get anybody on the radio. And so I was calling on the radio and a Japanese airline pilot answered. And I told him, well, we're the RAF Courageous and we think we'll be in Hawaii within the next week, week and a half. And all of a sudden the Coast Guard C-130 broke into the conversation. He said, Life RAF Courageous, you know, we're Coast Guard so-and-so and we're out looking for you. Now this was only the 56th day out. And so, uh, he homed in on the, the radio and he flew over us and uh, he said, you know, we're going to send a, uh, a helicopter out to pick you guys up. Now, we'd been in this life raft for, you know, 56 days and we kind of attached to it by this time and we wanted to make our own landfall. We really did because we knew if the Coast Guard picked us up, they'd classify us as a rescue and that's the last thing we wanted to be classified as. We were doing fine. Yeah, we were skinny, but we never had a cold. We never had a headache. We didn't have any physical problems whatsoever. Our urine was very dark. 
and a kidney specialist. When I gave the speech one time, there's Ephraims in the kidneys are made up. And those Ephraims, there's gazillions of them in your kidneys. So, but we were losing them at a fairly high rate. Our, our urine was very dark. And the kidney guy said, you know, you guys were in pretty serious trouble. But, you know, ignorance is bliss. And we weren't really briefed on that well. But anyway, we told the Coast Guard, no, we, we want to keep the life raft. So we just prefer not to. We'll just continue on. And so the Coast Guard came back and they said, well, look, we'll send a Coast Guard cutter that's in the area and we'll pick you up tomorrow and we'll pick the life raft up. I said, oh, okay, we can, we'll, we'll consider that. So Charlie and I were talking and then the Coast Guard came back and he was circling overhead all the time, came back on the radio and said, look, we're talking to Honolulu, we're talking to the Navy and they've sent those Navy doctors at trip, they're at Triple Army Hospital waiting for you guys. He said, oh, well, that's interesting. And uh, he said, oh, by the way, George, I've got a message right in my lap that says you are now an official Navy project. <laughs> so, so the Navy, once they realized we were almost there, really did get in back of the project. They had flown the doctors to a Triple Army Hospital there in Honolulu. But the bad part of it is they told us that the Navy says if you don't come in now, they're not going to complete the medical research because the doctors have been there for five days already. And I said, oh, geez. So we, we thought we might have some physical problems because of the urine being so dark. And so we talked and talked about it for about an hour. And we finally told the Coast Guard, okay, you know, you will come in with the cutter and they'll pick the life raft up. So that's, that's what they did. And, and we had had a little problems with the life raft anyway because we had some Dorado or dolphin fish, not the mammal, bite some hose in the bottom of the raft. And uh, so we had, you know, quite a bit of water and there was no way to patch the, the bottom of the raft. So anyway, that's what happened. The Coast Guard came out, picked us up, picked the, uh, in, a, in a cutter and picked the life raft up. And then they flew Charlie and I to the Triple Army Hospital. One quick thing I will mention here is that we did have a stethoscope and a blood pressure cuff with us. And one day, about 40 days into the trip, now we were losing a lot of weight. Charlie was taking my blood pressure. Our normal blood pressure is 120 over 80. And Charlie was pumping my arm up and he pumped it up about four or five times. I said, Charlie, that began to hurt. I said, what's the matter? And he looked at me and said, well, George, you're, you're failing or the instruments are. And I said, well, what are you getting? He said, I'm getting 80 over zero, no diastolic pressure. I said, why? You got to be kidding me. I said, give me that stuff. And so I put the stethoscope on and I put the cuff on Charlie. I got the same reading, 80 over zero. I could not get a diastolic pressure. Now that word, that's about the residual pressure, you know, forcing fluids that we did have through the body. And um, that's the same reading they got at Triple Army Hospital with more sophisticated instruments without a bunch of wind blowing through the stethoscope is 80 over zero. So it's primarily due to the great loss of weight. So I tell people, you know, if you have high blood pressure, you know, I consider losing a lot of weight and my blood pressure may drop. Well, listen, uh, I will fill some questions. My nephew's here today with me. Uh, well, we got a microphone, so. If, sorry. If anybody has any questions, you guys can just raise your hand. But I'd like to give him a round of applause. How amazing was that? <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> you know, I felt good about myself going camping, and now I feel like I just have nothing. He's, he's, man, that's amazing. So, first question. <laughs> what was the worst psychological moment for you during the trip? Well, uh, psychologically, Stan Stanford University got wind of this trip, and they, Stanford gave us a bunch of mental exercises to do and, and puzzles. Those were lost when we turned over on the second day. But I will tell you, our mental state was excellent. Um, I, on that raft trip, I could think of every teacher I had had by name from the first grade till I finished college. I couldn't do that ever. So our mental power was, we were very acute during the trip. We, like I say, we, we suffered from thinking about food all the time, but, but other than that, we were very sharp. You know, things we did in the life raft, we didn't feel like we suffered any whatsoever mentally. And we never, like I say, we never had a headache. We never had a cold. Um, and so in that manner, we did, we did get some saltwater sores only because we had scraped ourselves so badly when the boat overturned. And I'll tell you what, when you get a saltwater sores, the pain is agonizing. Not only is it 
uh, your body's fighting an infection, but it, the pain is so agonizing when you touch a saltwater sore, when it gets festered up, you almost jump out of your skin. So at night, if Charlie hit me and hit my arm where I had the saltwater sore, I just literally jump out of the raft. I mean, not literally, but uh, it, it was very, very uncomfortable having those saltwater sores. And, and by the way, that's another reason to wear clothing. A lot of castaways died because they got in the life raft in their swimsuit. And if they'd have taken some clothing to keep themselves from chafing against the life raft, they'd probably survived. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, thanks very much. An inspiring story. Uh, I've got two questions, on, and they're not related. Uh, I'm curious about um, when you were doing all your pre-voyage uh, research, how did you know or when did you know or did you know that, okay, I'm ready. You're, you're doing something that no one else has ever done. How do you know you have enough knowledge? Um, secondly, I'd, uh, I'd like to ask you about your, your sailing partner uh, who you mentioned was a man of great faith. And my question is, was there ever a time during your adventure that uh, his faith was a uh, positive or negative factor in your success? Okay. Well, uh, like I say, I spent nine months in a library researching over 3,000 counts of castaways. I, I think I had accounted for every contingency that I read about in, in those accounts. And, and like my fishing line, uh, it sounds like little stuff, but my hooks were made of stainless steel, the hooks that I put in the survival kit. And then a lot of castaways said, even though they had good hooks, the leader was made of monofilament line and trigger fish would come up under and take the hook, but they'd bite right through the line. So the line I used was, was a steel leader line, stainless steel leader line. And it's just a little thing, but I thought, you know, yeah, it's pretty discouraging to catch a fish just to have them bite through the leader. And so you really didn't catch them. Uh, so I, I had done everything that I could. Uh, and that's the reason I sell this rubber raft across the ocean. It was simply a quality control program. And I can tell you, I wish more people today, more manufacturers equipment would quality control like we did. But yes, we put our lives on the line to find out. I wanted to be the first one to find out what did not work in that survival kit and what did work. And it, fortunately for me, almost everything in that survival kit worked as advertised. I mean, a little thing like I told you about the knives and being, we use scuba knives. And I didn't use a blunt nose knife. You know, a lot of life rafts have blunt nose knives, but I can't tell you how many castaways I read about that said they needed a pointy knife to get through the skin of a turtle or a fish. So that's why we put that. Yeah, and I, as a matter of faith, uh, Charlie and I were both brought up in, he was Catholic, and I was brought up in a Methodist uh, family. But uh, yeah, he was very strong. Charlie uh, was amazingly uh, resilient. Uh, I mean, he was a volunteer on this. Th this was my survival kit, and Charlie was just kind of along for the ride, but uh, he did. He never talked about quitting. When we turned over and were in that much trouble, we never talked about quitting. We just said, yeah, was, that was a bad day. <laughs> but we, we just evaluated what we still had and continued on. And Charlie later, he did take the job with uh, American Airlines, and he retired a few years back, you have to retire by age 65 now. So, And by the way, I will mention, I, I, I've only been back in Pensacola a couple of years, but uh, I do have the largest flight school, even larger than uh, Auburn University over here at the Pensacola International Airport. So if anybody ever wants to take flight lessons, uh, come over and see us. The name of the flight school, believe it or not, is called Sky Warrior. And that's the same airplane I flew out here on the flight line, the A3 Sky Warrior. Any other questions? You said that the uh, raft was in the water for a couple of weeks before you left. Why, why did you do that? Well, I, I lived in a floating home, and, and, and there were two reasons. First of all, I took, the, you can see some of the pictures of the raft in the Oakland estuary here. Uh, I, I had to test the life raft to figure out how to rig the cell on it, and if the cell was gonna work on it, and if this whole thing was gonna work, if that life raft, and I took that rubber boat uh, a number of times, about 10 or 15 miles outside the Golden Gate, just to see how it, what it felt like to be in the open ocean. Look, I, I'd never been out in the open ocean in my life other than on an aircraft carrier, so 
uh, I just had to experiment with it and it was easy to keep it beside my house floating home. Uh, that was just the best place to keep it. And that's, that's one. And, and another reason, uh, in the floating home, I could test that solar steel. I was the world's expert on solar steels. I kept one in the water there for about six months. I knew every failure that could occur with that solar steel because if that solar steel had failed, we would have died. And so I had to know how to repair that thing and we had to put a repair kit in the survival kit to take care of that solar steel. Now, just a quick aside, we never got a rain on this whole trip. For 56 days, it never rained. And about 10 years later, I was ferrying an aircraft for a doctor. In fact, I had the doctor with me uh, from Oakland, California to, we were going down to a place called Hay, Australia. That's where he, his dental practice was. And we got about 600 miles south of the big island of Hawaii and I lost an engine. Now, when you're ferrying these little airplanes, this was a Cessna, a twin engine 310. I had so much fuel on the airplane, I couldn't, and there's no way to dump it. And the airplane just would not fly. And we were at 8,000 feet when we lost the engine and we just slowly descended. I turned around, headed back to Hawaii, and I ditched that airplane about 600 miles south of the Big Island of Hawaii. And so there I was again in the water. I told the doctor, I said, you know, doctor, I said, you're probably the luckiest guy I know. And he looked at me and said, George, we crashed my airplane. We're sitting in the life raft and we may die out here. And I said, yeah, I know, but I didn't tell you this part of the story. And I told him about, uh, you know, if I had been in a life raft than anybody, it'd be me that I'd want to be there with. So. Anyway, uh, on that trip, it never stopped raining. In fact, I told the doctor, I said, we cannot sit in this rain. I said, we're gonna get hypothermia. So we, I said, drink all the water you can hold and we'll put water in every container we could find, but we can't sit in this rain. So on Courageous, we never got any rain for 56 days. And then 10 years later, I was up in this little one or four person life raft and it wouldn't stop raining and we'd literally bail fresh water out of the life raft. What, yeah. what did the watch do for you? I didn't understand. The what? Watch. Your watch. Oh, the watch. Well, with the nav and by the way, I, I will say I donated a bunch of books. I've signed them all. They're in the, uh, I cannot possibly tell you all the things that happened to us. So I wrote this book and it's in the, uh, library. But the watch, uh, we timed the length of day from the time the upper limb of the sun came above the horizon until the upper limb of the sun went below the horizon in the afternoon. If we could time the length of day within about two minutes, we could determine within about a 30 nautical mile what parallel of latitude we were on. Now, I did put a protractor in the survival kit because in the northern hemisphere, every, most people know where the North Star is. So if you use a protractor with a string, you can see 22 degrees, and that's what we wanted to stay on, 22 degrees uh, latitude, north latitude. So we could use the North Star, but with the, if we didn't, if it was in the southern hemisphere, I didn't know anything about the Southern Cross. Believe me, I, I, I could not navigate using the Southern Cross. So I would have had to use solely the wristwatch in the, uh, the uh, what we call the solargram. But we had to have that watch to time the length of day from sunrise to sunset. And as I said, if we had an accurate watch that had, you know, we said Greenwich time to, we could determine our longitude so we could actually see how far or how fast we were, were making progress out to the west and how far we were actually from Hawaii. Oh, wait, uh, let me get the microphone. I'm sorry, here we go, you're fine. How was it um, to reintegrate with food once you got back to the mainland? Well, uh, that's a good question because uh, there's two things that come to my mind, but uh, we looked at, I'd read so many cases about castaways being picked up and then they fed them soup or hot water or something. We were so hungry. What happened in Hawaii, the helicopter flew us from uh, the Cutter to the uh, Honolulu International Airport. And then an ambulance took us up to the Tripler Army Hospital, which is just up the hill if you've ever been to Honolulu. And we passed to McDonald's. And I told the drivers, I said, stop at McDonald's, I said, because it's almost, uh, you know, it was about 1800, 1900 in the afternoon, or seven o'clock. And I said, the galley at the hospital is going to be closed and I'm hungry. 
And so they didn't stop. They said, no, no, the doctor said they don't want you to eat any food until they do some base rate studies. So we went to the hospital and they drew, did a bunch of blood draws, but they got the same uh, low blood pressure. And so we discontinued. They wouldn't do some of the experiments they wanted to do because they were scared about the blood pressure. But uh, they didn't have any refeeding program. The doctors, and so we had a really a nice nurse. Boy, she was beautiful. And she said, well, look, I'll go open the galley. I think there's some salami in there and some, and some heavy cream. And I said, man, I love heavy cream. I hate salami. But, but anyway, she made us some salami sandwiches. And I don't like salami sandwiches, but we ate them. We ate a big salami sandwich. We drank, I drank about a quart of heavy cream. And I felt terrible, but I held it all down. We didn't assimilate it much, uh, unfortunately, uh, because our intestines were so dry that we didn't assimilate much of that food. But we ate, our first meal was probably close to 10,000 calories. <laughs> I mean, it, it, was, it was pretty awesome. It was terrible and we didn't throw up or anything, but uh, we didn't feel very good after we ate that much. But no, we, we, they let us eat anything we wanted to eat and we didn't have any trouble with it. Now we did retain uh, water. We, uh, the, the body, when we got there, we started drinking a lot of water to rehydrate and our, our legs and arms did retain a lot of water and that was kind of painful. Uh, but that went away after about four or five days. Question on your survival kit, uh, as far as provisions for fishing, and did, did you have any, would you use lures or pieces, parts of other fish as, uh, as bait? And did you have any provisions for capturing uh, seabirds? Well, uh, great question. One morning, uh, it was probably about nine in the morning, I was resting in the bottom of the boat, and uh, all of a sudden I heard this terrible flapping noise and squawking, and God, I threw the tarp over me, and Charlie had a seabird, and, and, and he was holding it like this, and the bird was trying to, you know, peck his hand, and I couldn't believe we caught a seabird anyway by hand, and but I'd read about that, and uh, so finally, um, Charlie leaned over to the side of the laugh raft, and he drowned the seabird. Now, we were pretty hungry. This was probably 30 days into the trip or more. And uh, so we thought, well, we'll eat that seabird. That'll be great. And, and we read about all the, you know, you can suck the eyeballs of, of the fish. The eyeballs of, of marine animals have very little salt in them. And you can get a lot of water from that. And it sounds terrible, but believe me, if you're, it was very painful being dehydrated. It was not painful starving to death. In fact, when I look at people that are starving to death in some of these countries, I say, you know, I know there's no pain associated with it. One day you're just going to lie down and you're just not going to wake up starving to death. But I guarantee you being dehydrated was very painful and is uncomfortable. And that's why we kept hoping we'd get some rain. But uh, on the fishing side of the equation, I did a lot of research. I went to the finest fishermen in the world. And one day I was down in San Diego giving this speech at an Oceanographic Institute, and they had a great big map on the wall. And right in the middle of the map between Hawaii and San Francisco, it said, the ocean desert. And so I asked one of the scientists, I said, why is that called the ocean desert? And he said, George, it's relatively warm water. Warm water won't hold as much oxygen as cold water will. Without oxygen in the water, you're not gonna have the plankton in the water. If you don't have the bottom of the food chain in the water, you're not gonna have any fish in the water. He said, that's why you don't see any fishing boats out there between San Francisco and Hawaii. There isn't any fish to be had out there. And so that's, we did catch the shark. And once we got real close to uh, the, about 100, 200 miles off the coast of Hawaii, we saw these streaks coming through the water. It was those dolphin, uh, Dorado. And, uh, and we, could, we didn't have any way, they wouldn't buy it on the leader, but I put a, a wine sling was packed in the life raft because a lot of castaways said, you know, if we'd have had a spear, we could have just speared the fish because fish are attracted to shadows on the water and they'll come up under the life raft. So we had a spear and so Charlie got the spear and we speared one of those Dorados. Now that was, the root cause, I think, of the problem we had with the fish, because those Dorado were swimming around in a school of about four or five fish that, like I say, were coming around the life raft. We shot that first fish, and we brought that fish aboard, and we cut it up, and we ate it raw, you know, but we couldn't eat much of it because it's so high in protein, so we were very careful how much fish we could eat. But about 
30 minutes after we cut that fish up, something hit the boat from underneath with a violent, I mean, it shook the life raft. And we looked, we, we jumped over to the side and said, what the hell is going on? And it was those other four Dorado. And if you, if some of your naval aviators, if you remember the gun pattern, you know, you come around and shoot at the banner, that's what these fish were doing. They were going straight down under the life raft and they were coming straight up and they were biting hose in the bottom of the life raft. And you know, all of a sudden I saw water coming in. I said, Charlie, we got it. We only needed that one fish. That one fish we caught, you can see it in these pictures, was probably a 10 pound fish or greater. And that's, we, we knew we were close to Y. We didn't need that anymore, but we had to shoot the rest of those fish simply to protect the life raft. We had fish all over that life raft after that, but, uh, and, and we stored that fish. We dried it out and we put it in containers because I told Charlie, if we miss Hawaii, you know, we may be looking at Guam or Wake Island or Japan, the next evolution, but we did use some of that fish and put it out as bait, but we really never caught anything except that shark with my stinky old tennis shoes. But uh, yeah, we, we were finally able after 54 days to kill some fish. All right. Well, thank you very much. Enjoy the museum. <laughs> thank you, George. On behalf of everybody here in the foundation, I, I really do feel lucky to have heard that story firsthand, and I think everybody took a, away a lot from it. Um, but yeah, he's going to stay after, guys, for some question and answers if you guys want to hang out. Um, enjoy the museum. Thank you again for coming out. And our next Discovery Saturday is going to be Saturday, August 20th. And we're going to have Kevin Lace here. He's going to be talking about his new book called The Last Punisher. And Kevin Lace actually played himself in the movie of 2014, American Sniper, where he worked closely with Chris Kyle. So if you guys are here in town, we encourage you to come out. And there will be an actual book signing that will follow that presentation at the Flight Deck Museum store. And again, that's August 20th at 10 a.m. with Kevin Lace with his book, The Last Punisher, which is on sale now. So thank you again and stick around for Georgia and chat with him. Thank you. <laughs>